lot of our campuses are lying. Uh, again, go, go to El Paso or go down to the valley. These kids will they'll go to school for a semester, work part time, then they'll have to take off and work full time for a semester, and they come back. It's uh, it's just that's it, a different uh, a commuter or a big city university is different from some of these four year institutions like Vanderbilt or Harvard or Yale, where you go live on campus and you get your stuff done in four years and they get you out. And I think that would be everybody's uh, ideal situation. It's just uh, probably not going to happen with the way our different universities are constituted. Sure, and I, and I don't, don't need two more at this point because you do have the two very best graduation rates of all the public universities. You know, so University of Texas Austin is the highest, and my own favorite UT Dallas is the second highest. Um, but still, even those are in the sort of the mid-70 percentile after six years. Um, and so I, I just, I really, I really encourage you to look at the models of what other people have done. Uh, I, you, we need more people with college degrees. You have a very important mission, all three of you, uh, to, to, to have more people, more people graduate. Um, shifting, shifting over to information access for regions. Um, access to open records is very important to me. Um, my office receives, you know, we request it all the time workers and we comply with the law um, and my understanding is that you guys who are complying with that same law correct that's correct okay um, and I as a legislator have tremendous access to documents for the state government um, and, I mean for instance you know the, the email that Senator Burton read earlier you know she has the ability to access that and get it unredacted uh, the Office of Trade Hill report that was put out. I can get that unredacted. I can get any document within state government. Um, as an elected um, member of the Senate or the House, I should be able to get access to whatever documents are within that government that I can see fit. Um, the, um, I've actually filed legislation to allow school board, uh, excuse me, city council members, county commissioners, and uh, special district <coughs> members the ability to access documents. I have to say I'm a little confused. So I, or a citizen, can access documents within the UT system. As a legislator, I have the ability to access any documents in the UT system. It sounds to me like you're prevaricating a little bit on whether or not a region should be able to access documents within the system. No, I think uh, we have the right. Uh, I've never been denied access to any document or any information I've ever asked for. So uh, do you think that um, a member of the Board of Regents should be able to access any document within the system? I don't think so. The question becomes, is there uh, any such thing as an excessive uh, document request? I mean, uh, and that's, that's a judgment call, and I'm not in a position to make that judgment tonight. Well, I think that legally, um, you know, if somebody called in my office and said, I want to see every email, every email that you have on file, had the last 30 days, I'm legal, legally, I'm obligated to hand that all over. There's really not. And, and the regions have the same uh, freedom of information request rights, uh, and, and they have, we have regions that do that. They go directly to an institution and ask not as a region, but as a citizen for certain documents. Uh, and I think you know, we have, there's a whole team of <laughs> many lawyers that that's all they do is work on the information requests, both at the system and the board level. And, uh, and I, I have not seen it, any problems myself with that. Okay, but so if someone were to say want access to every document in the UT system, so it's just Bill Power's name, I mean, a citizen could open records request that and get it, right? Well, they would probably be delayed for a while because <laughs> that's, a, that's a big request. I'm going to say it's a huge request. But they can ask for it and they can receive it. Unless the Attorney General uh, rules otherwise. I think that's the way it normally works. Right. I mean, and then um, I just, I just, I want to, I guess I'm not really hearing a commitment on your part. So should a region have access to any document, as many documents as they want to see? That's pretty simple. It's, and I think that's already a rule, right? It's like, yeah. Okay, so that's already a rule. Do you support that rule? Do you think it needs to be changed? Should you somehow try to restrict the document access for I don't members think, of the I don't think uh, restriction is the right uh, terminology. I think there has to be some practicality involved and if you're if you are requesting 200,000 documents that will take uh, you know there's, there's time limits involved this too you're given five days to prepare the documents and there's certain cases where that just cannot be done and I think we have to have a reasonable set of 
guidelines that uh, allow our, uh, the supporting institutions to provide that information in a timely basis. So I'm, I'm very supportive of Regents being able to look at whatever document they want to look at, if that answers your question. Again, it sounds like you're prevaricating about you want some kind of reasonable standard, but who would who would who would come up with this reasonable standard? Who's going to decide that? Well, we have a you know we have a CEO of our organization that's uh, well qualified. I think if he tells uh, if I ask for two hundred thousand documents and he tells me that's a huge request, it's going to take me uh, working with the system and it's going to take me six weeks to get that. Uh, I think I would be okay with that. Uh, because of the work involved in producing it. Uh, it's a little different than asking for a single document, an email between so-and-so and so-and-so, so, -and -so, -and -so that they can be produced overnight. Uh, so, so you think that, uh, I'm sorry, so who, who's going to decide what your access is? Well, the information request today, they go to the chancellor of the system, and he uh, handles that, uh, assigns that uh, to be fulfilled. So you want the chancellor of the system to decide which documents you can and can't get? No, not which documents is not what I'm saying, but if it is a massive request that uh, is going to take uh, manpower that he needs to either put together or set aside or get the member institutions uh, the backup they need to do it, uh, then I think he needs to have some flexibility in how to, to handle these ma massive information requests. Let me, let me shift over to your relationship with other members of the Board of Regents. I think that we all want to see a harmonious board. I don't think anybody's got to that way. Uh, they can work together, solve problems, go after them. Uh, I mean, are you the right person for a harmonious board? You know, I think if, uh, I don't know, if it's been done in my career, it's somebody that tries to bring, bring people together to find a common uh, interest and in a way to go forward. I, I've not been uh, ever looked upon as an extremist. That's the question, so I think I have the ability to work with other people. Let me let me shift now to the will of the people. Um, so, as I'm very aware because I'm elected that I work for the people who sent me here, um, and um, clear, clearly the, the will of the people is who who we serve on this dais, who we expect you to serve when you're serving as a region. Um, is that, does that make sense to you? Is that clear to you? It does, yes, absolutely. That's the ultimate uh, shareholder uh, in the corporate sense. The shareholders are, are the citizens of the state of Texas. And I, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, the University of Texas was founded by the legislature, right? By, it's in the Constitution, it's, right? That's correct. Founded by the people, okay. Um, if, um, you know, a majority of the senators or the majority of the House members sign a document saying we want you to think you should do X or Y. Is that something you'll take into consideration? Absolutely. Be foolish not to. You can expand on that. <laughs> well, I mean, to me it has to be a cooperative effort. I mean, the source of a significant amount of our funding comes from the legislature. A lot of the rules that we're governed under comes from the legislature. Uh, the thing that people forget about the UT system is that we're about two thirds of our business really is not in academic; it's in healthcare. So there's a whole new level of uh, cooperation with the legislature that we have to achieve. Uh, it's a massive amount of what we do. So not taking because uh, to me, both the House and the Senate are the people's representatives, and we if we, if we don't listen to you. Shame on us. Um. Consider the University of Texas system as you go as you go back. So you have six years of experience, which is terrific. Are you? Do you need to turn around this institution? Do you need to reinvent it, or are you just in a steady state? Where are you? Where are you as a leader? Where is this institution as you see it? That the UT system itself. You know, I have uh, I have my own personal opinion on that. If I can share that, I think it's. Uh, I think we have. Uh, I think it's overstaffed. And I think there's some duplication of services that we need to uh, take a really close look at. Because to me, the people that are uh, that work for the UT system staff need to be there to serve those institutions. And uh, 
and not um, just getting away with red tape and uh, stuff. So I think what the chancellor has told me is he wants to meet with each of the, uh, the presidents, find out what things the system is doing that are important to them, which things the system are doing that are a nuisance to them. And we're going to try to uh, right size the system to serve those institutions. Uh, there's some things, it's kind of like the argument between federal government and state government. There's some things, very few, that can be done better at the federal level. Uh, I think the treasury operation and the investment operation done at the system level is very good. Some of the uh, legal stuff has to be done at the system level. But I think most uh, good decisions as it affects the students in Odessa are made at the uh, campus in Midland Odessa. And not by uh, somebody sitting in an office in Austin, Texas. So I, I, I personally like getting as much of the day-to-day -day decision making opportunity down to the institutions that actually have the students uh, in them. What are your, and then just to that, to that end, what, what are your goals for the next six years? What do you want to, you know, when you're done in six years, what do you want to look back and say, hey, I got these things done? Well, um, again, I'm opening a new medical school in Austin is very high on my list. Uh, opening the new uh, UT Rio Grande Valley is going to be a real milestone uh, for, uh, for us. I think we have... Uh, if you ask me, nobody's asked the question, but the question was asked, what are the biggest problems in the UT system today? It's not the, uh, in my opinion, it's not the admissions at UT Austin. It's uh, the problems we have at MD Anderson. And there's, uh, as you've read the paper, there's faculty, the uh, Senate is, uh, is very unhappy. There's uh, problems that we need to address and how that uh, institution is uh, managed and staffed. So those are the kind of things uh, that I, I would like to spend more of my time I think uh, you know, you've got an institution that's trying to cure cancer, and that's pretty important stuff. So we have a new hospital in Dallas that we've opened. There's a, so on the health side, there's a, a lot of things we need to do to educate and prepare the next level of uh, doctors in the medical age. On the student level, I think having, uh, it's, to me, it's a three-pronged student. I think you have to have uh, affordability, accessibility, and quality. And if you kind of should, Check either one of those three things, the stool's going to fall over. So I think keeping a balance of that and not losing sight of the quality or the affordability and making access to as many Texans as possible. We've done some great, we answered uh, Governor Perry's request for a $10,000 degree. And we have those at three of our institutions today where you can actually get a four year degree for $10,000. So making it affordable, I think meeting the um, one of the things I want to do more of when we've done it with an engineering task force, we're looking at on the business side. It's making sure we have the graduates available for the Texas workforce that the Texas workforce is calling. There's a huge need for engineers if you look for the next 20 years and we're ramping that up to, uh, to meet that need. So those are the kind of things I really want to work on in the next six years and hopefully in a harmonious uh, fashion. And to me, the less you would read about the UT Board of Regents, I think that would be the better. And especially any uh, disagreements, so that would be my goal. Is you know, to that end, though, I mean, you're, you're an accomplished business leader. I mean, you've, you've had a great, a great record, a great career. We're lucky to have you willing to serve. Is it your experience as a leader that it's more important to protect your reputation or to address a problem than solve it? I'm not sure it could be either or. I mean, to protect your reputation, you have to uh, you have to ask the hard questions and make sure things are being done right. And so, protect say, in general, I, I should protect and serve, but I can't protect without uh, making sure that things are being done. So I, I, I don't think that's, a, that's not an A-B choice that I can make. I would say protect, but also ask hard questions. Well, but, you know, you might see a problem that maybe you could look the other way and hope that it's not there the next time you look, or a problem that you want to go solve. Which one of those two would you choose? Solve the problem. Okay. So to that end, go back to um, go back to the uh, to the brought this up, the, um, you know, where you have it. Oh, no, actually, I'm sorry, sir, the chairman though. Um, going into the search committee and have you know clearly a release 
of confidential information that's a crime under state law, it's, it's pretty serious. What actions have you taken as a result? But it, and I mean, and there are other institutions, I'm reasonably confident that Texas Tech chose their chancellor without having an issue. So it can be done, it's possible. Um, what, what have you done to address the most immediate leak? I have not, I'm not, uh, you know, Vice Chairman, we have not, uh, it just happened in the last few weeks, we have not had a meeting or, or done anything. Uh, as I told uh, Senator Bergwell, I think the thing we need to look at is the process. Because once you bring uh, 50 or 60 outside people in and, and have the, uh, the pony parade, it's, it's very hard to keep those names uh, confidential. What will you do? I mean, and, and, and not, I mean, not process, but I, I, I mean, there was um, in Senate Finance last week, uh, an agency had talked about where he had a confidential meeting with you know, a dozen staffers. He discussed a contract. He got a call the next morning about that contract. He, you know, so the confidential information had been leaked. He brought 13 people in the room and said, who leaked it? Someone put their hand up and fired them. I think that's exactly what he should have done. I commend him for his leadership. I'm not hearing that from you. You've had several weeks. I, and, and furthermore, let me say that in this case, we have official misconduct. And this is this is actually this this problem is more serious than what he dealt with. I think he did a good job of handling that problem. From what I can tell, you haven't done anything to handle this problem, unless I'm mishearing. Well, I think the first information I saw was in a blog piece. It was about 50% accurate. They had one of the candidates completely wrong. Uh, and you know, I don't think you respond to things like that. Uh, you know, but do people, uh, how do you keep that a total confidence? We did a very good job on the Chancellor search of keeping that confidential. You know, I was involved with the um, athletic director search where we did a good job of keeping that confidential, but it didn't, it didn't have the same process to where they have to come in and meet with the, the faculty and meet with all the students uh, during a confidential period. So to me, the biggest thing we can do is change the process to where that confidentiality stays in place until a decision is made. Uh, and that's the structural things that I would talk about uh, trying to change. I, I think we need that structural change. And I think that's in the best interest of the system, of the candidates that want to come and work with the system, uh, and in your best interest. Absolutely. Um, so you don't have to answer these kind of questions. <laughs> I would look forward to that. <laughs> um, um, I, again, appreciate you taking the time to, to be here today. And appreciate you taking, taking all the long questions. Uh, Senator Watson. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Jakes, let me follow up on part of the, that's been brought up. Uh, first of all, before a statement, the statement was just made that there was official misconduct. And, and I understand that the statute says that if someone who signs a confidentiality agreement breaches the confidentiality <coughs> sorry, the molds in Austin. Have you done anything about the molds in Austin? Uh, we have a four year plan on that. Let me go back. What the document says, what the statute says, is if someone is required to sign that confidentiality agreement and they breach that confidentiality agreement, then there may be official misconduct. While it's been said that there was official misconduct, no one, and I assume uh, Senator Taylor or no one here, knows who might have disclosed names to someone who put it up on the wall, and whether that person was someone that had signed such a confidentiality Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and what I hear you, you describing is a process that is also talk about goals that we want to achieve for the University of Texas system. One of the goals of the system is to have transparency and who the system might hire. Is that correct? That's correct. And part of the way you have transparency in who you might hire is that you bring those candidates for hiring into Austin, into a process where they are then introduced 
to a large segment of the population. Is that right? That's correct. And that's to achieve the goal of transparency. Yes, and to get their input on the uh, decision-making process. Well, that would be the second goal. Transparency and the second goal would be to have other people besides just a small group of people help make the decision. Is that right? That's correct. One of the conflicts, if you will, between transparency and confidentiality is that sometimes transparency causes a breach of confidentiality. Is that correct? That is correct. And not everybody that is involved in the process for transparency signs a confidentiality agreement. Is that correct? I don't know that the students involved, I would doubt that they signed a confidentiality agreement. I, at least that hasn't been the case in the past. So, so when you suggest that what you would like to do is look at how we achieve we, we look at the process. Uh, I, I, what I understand you to suggest is that we're looking at how do we assure transparency and at the same time, or as much transparency as the system will allow, and at the same time protect confidentiality. I suggest to you that if you wouldn't, if we were in a situation where we had a system where nobody could ever know the names until there was smoke that went out of the, uh, the tower. Um, <laughs> you would be criticized for a lack of transparency. That would be the case. Uh, I, I wish you well on trying to figure out a process that avoids criticism for a a lack of transparency or keeping everybody's name secret because I'm not sure that you can achieve such a perfect system, but I, I know you'll give it your best shot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vistas? I will be very brief. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate your service in this wonderful school on to the state. Back to the graduation rates and kind of piqued my interest. You know, we talked about, uh, Senator Taylor talked about universities that have 4%, universities that have 98%. You mentioned that you have goals in place. You have to set those goals. Right now, I guess overall you're in about mid 50 percent. What are your goals, and what's the time frame? I think you said five years. Yeah, last year, each of our uh, nine academic institutions, uh, in consultation with the then chancellor, set specific goals for what they were going to do for every university. For every university. And so, uh, I guess on the average. In five years, if you got them to 75%, would you consider that very successful? Or what? I mean, what is there a figure in your mind where you want to get to in five years? Again, there's not a one-size-fits-all because of the difference in institutions. I mean, I, just to think UT Austin, they, they have a goal of getting it over 70% of four-year graduation rate. Which what is it now? The main campus? It's uh, 50 in the 50s, not 57. Okay, so I mean, in my mind, that would that would be considered a big problem. Yeah, they have a whole group of people working on that on campus, uh, trying to find ways to. Uh, and I think part of it is intervening early with these students. That it's not only that it takes longer. When, when someone graduates, instead of with 120 hours, a lot of our people come out with, with 150 hours when they graduate. Yeah. That's a wasted year in terms of the degree that it costs the taxpayers. We need to be more efficient in how we get the students through that system. I know you can change a major and lose some, but we need to uh, really work with these students up front and every year on taking the courses they need to be able to graduate in four years. Well, having been a student that squeezed a four-year education into six years, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate you being here. Appreciate you. Thank you. Some very uh, uh, good answers to a lot of tough questions. <coughs> Members of the questions, Senator Vegas. Uh, you know, in the interest of time, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to uh, uh, limit my questions to just one. Uh, and it has to do with tuition revenue bonds. I think we've uh, heard a lot about the need that our campuses have for capital improvements. Uh, I know that the UT system, uh, especially uh, University of Texas at El Paso, has a need for some uh, buildings in order to achieve the goals that uh, Governor Abbott uh, described in his State of the State Address of uh, providing support for uh, universities to conduct research and achieve 
uh, you know, some of them T01 status, uh, as, U, as UTEP is seeking. Uh, so I, I take it that you are all in support of uh, uh, funding capital improvements in our universities this session, whether it be through the usual tuition revenue bond route or through some other funding mechanism. I think there's about four or five that have been banded about, but uh, the point is, I think our universities are in dire need of uh, either constructing new facilities uh, in place of the 50-year-old facilities that we have, or uh, remodeling. Uh, so I just wanted to ask about your thoughts on that and whether uh, the UT system, the Board of Regents, is going to be supportive, uh, not just for itself, but for the other universities across the state. I think all the universities, uh, especially in the STEM fields, I mean, when you say a new building, uh, a lot of times it's replacing a lab that's 50 years old that's technically obsolete. So if we're going to uh, achieve tier one status for some of these universities, we have to invest in the capital improvements it's going to take to be able to attract the, the researchers to come in and do the work to get there. So, uh, but, you know, ultimately that's uh, the job of the legislature to uh, decide or not to decide whether there'll be any you know, DRBs. I know the last couple of sessions I've chosen not to. And, uh, I think we all have our fingers crossed for what might happen this time, but I think we have to be prepared to go forward no matter what. Right, and, and with respect to new buildings, like the example I can give you is, uh, and I know other universities have the same request, but uh, at the University of Texas at El Paso, we've had a request for funding a multidisciplinary uh, building in order to provide the adequate facilities for researchers and the labs and such that come with, with, uh, with, with research. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if, if we don't, as a state, invest in those kinds of, uh, of improvements, uh, then we just simply are not going to remain competitive in achieving the tier one status that we uh, aspire to, and which Governor Abbott mentioned to, that we need to, to support in order to be competitive with the systems in California, New York, and Illinois. That's correct. We, you know, to attract the kind of uh, researchers we'd like to get. And there's a big opportunity out there, I think, because the Texas economy does well, better than some of the other states we compete with, uh, to attract these people to come to Texas. But if you're a top, like researcher, they want a, they want a facility that will uh, help them do their research. And I think for us to be able to do that, we're going to have to spend some money. To get done. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Senator Burke, you had one follow-up? Yes, one follow-up, please. Um, so, Mr. Hicks, you said already that you signed the confidentiality agreement on the president's search, correct? You're... I think so. I, I've signed so many of them, but I think that was one of them, yes. Okay. So, since it wasn't asked or after the acts, did you share any information, such as names, compensation, or your opinion of any candidate via email to anyone outside of the search committee? Uh, I, should, I should share no names. The only uh, information I've shared with the uh, Governor's staff was uh, not by name, but a concern I have uh, the compensation levels that some of the, the new talent might be requesting is, is a concern to me. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Senator Burton, thank you. Um, Ken Winch and Hitch, thank you for, uh, for spending an hour and 40 minutes <laughs> with us. We, we very much appreciate it. My pleasure. It. I appreciate uh, everything that uh, <laughs> the legislature does to. Uh, <laughs> confidentiality agreement with that statement? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it just, in all seriousness, I mean, it, whether it's my duty as a chairman or an individual senator or the other senator's duties together collectively on the committee or on behalf of the entire Senate, we take our duty very seriously here. And that's really what we're looking for from those that will lead uh, the University of Texas system. And they recognize I think Watson, it, it's an honor, but it's also a huge responsibility. I recognize Senator Watson's concern that they don't want to deal with classified information, in this case, confidentiality agreements. As you expand that span of, of control or uh, that challenge, it does become more difficult. So I, t I think it's very appropriate for you to look at do you structurally change something that tightens that shot group of people, recognizing that difficulty. Well, I'm interested, and I think Senator Watson would concur, that looking for the discipline 
that comes with that obedience to the law from whatever that group of people is, uh, as you look at the, the rules that govern the, the Board of Regents in choosing someone, whether it's the other issues that we've spoken about, the range of tuition, admissions, all those things. We are servants of the people of the state of Texas. Um, sometimes that's euphemistically used.